welcome. Well, first of all, welcome from Lancaster up north, which is not where uh, the podcast is taking place from. Um, but it's taking place through the Centre for Alternatives to Social and Economic Inequalities. And we are really pleased to be able to host this podcast, um, which is on talking about citizenship in global Britain. At the end, we will tell you about more exciting events that are happening. But for now, I'll hand over to the key speakers, Mikola. I'm introducing you as the Professor of Public Engagement at Lancaster. Mikola's just joined the department. We will. And will make, no <laughs> doubt, as much an impact as she did at Goldsmiths. Uh, Mikola has been doing research on Brexit and Brexit in Europe for some time. She's going to be talking about her second project, but she did previous work before this. Mikola has also worked on expats in Panama, in Hong Kong, uh, and literally looked at issues of clonality, migration, class and race around the world. She also, before, before getting involved in Brexit, <laughs> before, did lots of work on the middle class in France and Britain, as well as projects on architecture and urban space. So we're getting a very well-rounded perspective on citizenship in global Britain. So over to you, Mikola. Thank you. OK, so here we are in the studio. I hope everyone can hear us. Um, thank you, Bev, for that very, very generous introduction. Um, um, and I suppose my starting point here is to introduce who I'm joined with in the studio today. And I'm joined with Ch Chantal um, Lewis, who some of you will know is the co-founder and um, co-host of the amazing Surviving Society podcast, which from memory is the best, the most popular sociology podcast. <laughs> Um, but Chantal is also a long-standing um, collaborator with me. We've worked together over the last few years um, on the work that we did on Brexit together. Chantal was one of the researchers who joined me in that project. She's also just completed her PhD at Goldsmiths and is now a junior research fellow at Oxford and Pembroke College um, and Torch, I think. Um, so I'm really delighted that she's here today. My other uh, friend in the studio is George Kalivas, who is a PhD student in visual sociology at Goldsmiths. And he um, came to me um, when I was calling out for someone to come and help me to do some research with the podcast. And he's been the most fantastic researcher, but he's also an incredibly talented artist. He has produced all of the artwork for this um, podcast and you'll hear him in the podcast where he goes back into the archives and uncovers all sorts of really really fascinating um, pieces of kind of newspaper archive and parliamentary records that really help to bring the story of British citizenship to life. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about the podcast that we're launching today. The podcast is called Who Do We Think We Are and it is focused on questions of what British citizenship is and isn't. It tries to debunk some of the taken for granted understandings that people have when they think about citizenship today by bringing in kind of conversations about its slightly obscure history, I would say. Um, and it also features some fantastic academics, some lawyers, and in time it's also going to be featuring some, some campaigners and activists who work on these issues. So um, that's, that's what we're launching today. And how we're going to do it is we're actually just going to have a chat. Um, we're going to talk about citizenship a little bit, and then we'll open up to Q&A in about 45 minutes, I think. So, 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 yeah. Um, so, I will hand over to Chantelle, who's going to be asking the first question. 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mikola, and thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me to come um, on this launch of your podcast. Um, it's such an exciting podcast. It's a brilliant podcast that I've had the pleasure of listening to, um, and it's just really great to see your work develop in this way through this kind of um, in this public sociological terrain, but also the types of conversations. Thinking about the types of conversations we had together when we were working on the Brexit project, and how much of of both your scholarship and yourself is in this work and I just think that's always really powerful um often as sociologists we don't want to talk about how our um family histories and lived experiences inform our work so I really really admire and look up to scholars like Mikola that do this um so just on that note um it'd be really great to just start off by explaining i guess to the audience like how you came to move on to this work on citizenship coloniality and borders because as someone as your friend and collaborator like i know this is something that's been embedded in your praxis but it's not necessarily been something that's always been visualized and actualized within the work that you've put out but i know it's been at the forefront of why you wanted to do this stuff so yeah does that yeah, that's a really, I think that's a really good starting point, Chantal. And I was I was thinking about this question on my way here today and thinking about how significant that work on Brexit was in bringing me to this stage. And I think really what it was is kind of thinking about what was troubling me so much about the narratives that were emerging about Brexit and the transformation of people's rights. Um, and thinking, well, you know, there was there was a certain degree to which, certainly in the public domain, this was being presented as though it was novel, this removal of people's rights through Brexit. And that just didn't really sit very well with me, because it was very clear to me that on a longer basis, this, you know, this had happened before, that there was actually a slow process through which People's rights had been eroded, people who were once citizens becoming migrants over that long period of time. So I started to think about earlier political transformations and thinking how, about how Brexit might be understood in terms of a transformation of the British state and thinking about the shift in its borders. Um, so obviously the, the most obvious example that came to mind was that, that period of decolonisation where Britain was transforming from an empire into a nation state and all of the legislation that was introduced over um, in those times around nationality but then later around migration and introducing migration controls against um, its own citizens to some degree. So so that was kind of how I started to come into it. But there was another thing that was was bugging me, I would say, which was that when we have these conversations about Britain's borders, we're often talking about the people who make it to the borders or the people who are living within the borders. And we seem to forget that even in the present day, Britain has people who hold a form of legal status and British nationality law who've never lived in the UK and, and perhaps never will, but they live all over the world still. So, so And I'm not just talking about British citizens who've emigrated abroad. I'm talking about, for example, the British nationals overseas, the Hong Kongers, who hold this status in British law. And yet, even in some of the most critical scholarship around citizenship in Britain today, actually, they're not, they're not very prominent in those discussions. And I was troubled about why that was. You know, why aren't they there when there's three point X million of them, for example, um, and what does it tell us that even our kind of really good critical scholarship about borders doesn't really quite know how to deal with them? So I think for me, I'm always interested in the stories that aren't being told and asking what it does to not tell those stories and trying to find ways of bringing them in in a way that debunks kind of myths um, about things. So in this case, about citizenship. And I guess on that point, I'm really glad you brought up Hong Kong because I thought, is she going to say Hong Kong? Is she going to say Hong Kong? Come on, let's well, bring up Hong Kong. Can you talk about your own family history and connection to Hong Kong and how that has, I mean, in the podcast, you're very like, it, it's at the forefront of the introduction and it's weaved through. That's why I think it's such a, a powerful way of sociological storytelling the whole show is that in, interweaved within the episodes is your family history and you trying to piece together why those erasures around Hong Kongers and citizenships have been able to manifest and what that now means 
I think we're going to talk about this a little bit later on in the show, but what that now means with the, the change of um, status for Hong Kongers in, in contemporary Britain. Yeah, you, you've brought me back to, to making sure that I remember to talk about Tell them who you history. are, Mikola. <laughs> Tell them who you are. They want to know. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I think it's a, it's a kind of curious, um, it's a kind of a making and unmaking um, of, of myself and my family history. And, you know, I, I mean, I remember early conversations that you and I had, and you've been really central, Chantelle, in, in making me um, make visible that family history. So... My grandmother was the third generation of a Muslim family born in Hong Kong. My mother was born in Hong Kong to her um, Hong Konger mother and my grandfather, who was UK born. So I have a kind of a mixed heritage. My mum didn't come to the UK until she was 18 years old to live. Um, so she was raised in Hong Kong. And, and I know that her experience of moving here was was like, you know, being being a migrant, coming to a place that she hadn't been to, I mean, she'd visited, but hadn't lived in. Um, and I think that over the course of my life, it's what's been curious about it is that Hong Kong was a colony until 1997. So within my lifetime, and yet that story of Britain as a nation state was so prominent while I was growing up, that people seem to have forgotten that the British Empire essentially did continue until 1997. And so all of those conversations seem to have just been overlooked when it comes to the case of the of the British Hong Kongers, essentially. Um, and it was, um, for me, I, I'd always wanted to, to look at the case of Hong Kong. Um, it was what drove me to do my undergraduate studies, but also something that I toyed with when I first started doing my PhD and then realised I, I couldn't afford to take myself to, to, to Hong Kong in order to do research over there. So it's almost like I've come back full circle and I found a question that I could answer through looking at Hong Kong, which is to do with, you know, understanding the differential rights that British nationality legislation um, has brought in and, and thinking about what that can tell us in the present day. Powerful stuff, Mikola. And just for the purpose of the audience that aren't necessarily familiar with the relationship between Britain and Hong Kong, that 1997, that period's called hand. Was it called handover? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it's better to refer to it as a transfer of sovereignty from Fine. Britain to China. But um, but yeah, that's what more commonly, colloquially, it's called handover. And some people would also say that that was like the final step in Britain's decolonisation. But I think the important thing when we're thinking about Hong Kong is that Hong Kong itself did not decolonize. Mm. It's just that Britain, de that was Britain's final kind of um, political decolonization, at least. Mm -hmm. So just moving on to thinking more about the actual creative and dialogical praxis of this podcast, um, George. You're amazing. Like I love I love it when I meet academics that bring in like this creative and artistic flair. Obviously, like we are, even if we just use the written word, that's also a very creative way of doing things. But when I meet academics that are also artists, I'm like, wow, you're amazing. And <laughs> I guess it would be really good to sort of tell um, the listeners, tell the audience a bit about the kind of brand development of this podcast because it's very distinctive and I remember seeing it and I hadn't actually spoke to Mikola about when you were developing the brand and I just saw it. I was like, wow, who's done that? And Mikola was like, oh, my new researcher, George, he's incredible. <laughs> I was like, I'm so excited to meet him. So yeah, can you tell the audience a little bit about oh. the brand identity and the logo? Yeah, sure. Oh, thank you so much and uh, <laughs> your kind words and thank you, Mikaela, also for inviting me here today. Um, it's been great working together overall. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, when Michaela basically uh, we were talking about the logo and when she asked me uh, to present some ideas, I immediately started thinking about the research I had already done, which was mostly archival research. So uh, this process of looking into archives of either newspapers, um, you know, um, uh, governmental debates. And then I realized that what we're like, what I was doing basically for myself even was this um, way of looking back to refigure what uh, obvi what was obvious, what I, I thought was obvious in terms of uh, what we've learned to to be British or not. So then um, the logo kind of embodies that eventually, this kind of idea 
of looking back to refigure uh, what's obvious or not, you know. So basically the image of the podcast is a digital sketch of this figure that in a way embodies Britishness in itself. So it has a resemblance of the British flag on its body, but it's not really the, the exact colors of the British flag. It's just something to remind that. And then the figure emerges out of cluster of roots and... Um, so I think this is like the way of, you know, looking back, looking to our roots. And then uh, it emerged out of there and it has, uh, it does this gesture with its arms uh, and hands. It's, it's raised like that. So basically just questioning or wondering about its own existence uh, with the title above its head with a big question mark saying, who do we think we are? So I think eventually, for me, that's what the logo represents, uh, an image of Britishness uh, questioning and wondering and refiguring itself in a way. That's really powerful, George. And um, one thing, until we kind of spoke about it in detail together in our in our pre-chat, um, I hadn't noticed the kind of off colours as well. And that in itself is about telling a story, isn't it? Like... Am I actually associated with the, this the banality of national this nationalist symbol or not? And like you, you bring that across in the colours not being quite yeah it's, exact. That is so deep. <laughs> like, <laughs> sorry, but it's so cool. It is like to what extent I'm related with that or yeah. how exactly? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Really cool. Um, so Mikola, next question relates to something that we talk about a lot. Um. So thinking about citizenship, thinking about migration, thinking about borders, these questions and this, these kind of analyses and these kind of what you've, what you've done in your work more recent years, kind of myth busting around these matters, has kind of been in opposition to the zeitgeist of these topics. What I mean by that is over the past few years, whether it's to do with... Um, the increased author authoritarianism of the Home Office or the continued authoritarianism of the Home Office or the um, Windrush scandal. All these things have kind of been very much built up within the media landscape, but also actualised in people's lived experience of violence at the border. But one of the things that has definitely kind of come across for us as sociologists and as public sociologists is that sometimes people either miss out the facts around these matters they don't know them or they say things that simply aren't true <laughs> which is really which is which is of course troubling for people that have worked on these matters like yourselves and lot and like yourself and lots of others for a long time so when when these topics rightly so are brought into the public domain what can well I guess I'm going to say what can we do as public sociologists to resist and kind of bring to the forefront like the facts of these matters and I think that is what you've done in this podcast but I guess it would be good to sort of talk a bit about how your work which I'm really inspired by on, on a daily basis is always about locating the existing scholarship rather than presenting reactionary individualized account around a topic which is kind of quote-unquote on trend. Yeah, I think that there are a few things there, Chantal. I think that there's the like, question about how understanding what's happening in the present around citizenship and migration also means looking to the history of how the inequalities that we're seeing in the present were produced. Um, and I think that um, the other side of that is how as scholars we make sure that we are doing our own due diligence in terms of looking at the scholarship that's gone before and thinking about how that, how we're in conversation with that, how that helps us to think in the present, um, what what it what what it can really open up for us. So, um, on the first point, I think that for me, looking at the case of you know um, of, of the of, of the construction of the contemporary citizenship migration regime, um, and looking at some of the fallout from that, whether it's the kind of the headlines, the Windrush deportation scandal whether it's um, some of the things that are being discussed at the moment through the Nationality and Borders Bill, which is, includes kind of providing solutions to some of the loopholes, some of the gaps, I would say, not the loopholes, the gaps that were created through the British Nationality Act of 1981. I think we need to start asking the question not just about the fact that there are those inequities, those real injustices which are racialized 
within um, British nationality legislation. But we need to go back and we need to ask the question of how those were produced and what that tells us about the making of Britishness, the making of belonging at that point in time. And I think that will also help us to see that although there are efforts at the moment to kind of provide solutions now, for example... um, providing routes to citizenship for people who had it deprived from them through the um, through the actions of the British state um, and providing that for free, I still think we need to have the conversation about why it happened in the first place and how it happened in the first place. So I'm really interested in looking at that longer standing production of inequalities and then asking and then thinking about what questions that might cause us to ask differently. So in the first episode, for example, which you've heard, which is with Gaminda Bambra, um, we talk about actually how that history of um, basically the removal of rights over a long and protracted period of time, how if we remember that, we might be asking really different questions about migrant justice, about racial justice in Britain today. And I think that's really important because actually, if you start to look at that longer history, you start to see that those distinctions between citizens and migrants that so many people reproduce, including ourselves sometimes, Mm -hmm. um, really have been produced through a whole set of state actions. So people who we think of as migrants, and I think the opening quotation from the um, podcast with Gaminda is precisely about how she... um, was basically she grew up believing that she was a migrant because that's what people told her all of the time. And yet when she goes back and she looks at her father and her grandfather's passports, they say that they were British citizens or that they they had a citizenship status um, in, in, in the British Empire. And so that kind of, that recognition, I think, troubles some of the assumptions that we have about migration today. So I think that there's some repair work that we can do through looking at those histories. But I've also been struck recently by, you know, there's a zeitgeist within academic scholarship as well around citizenship and migration. And I I really um, think that, you know, there's been some fantastic scholarship historically on these issues. So there's a kind of a really important central text by Anne Dumet and Andrew Nicholl, where they actually trace quite comprehensively the history of the movement from subjecthood through to actually the Maastricht Treaty, so through to the introduction of freedom of movement in the UK. And there's another wonderful book by um, a scholar called Raiko Karatani that's called Defining British Citizenship. It blew my mind when you showed me that book. Yeah. Because like, I, when I was writing about, like writing at the end of my PhD, you were like, you, you looked at something before me, you were like, Chantel, you need to look at this book. I was like, oh, it's, ama- it's such an amazing book, the Caratani book. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, and, and also there's, there's, there's a book by Kathleen Paul called Whitewashing yep. Britain, which also goes through that history and shows, um, you know, that process by which Britishness became racialised as white. And I think that... Um, We can learn a lot from going back and looking at those texts and thinking with them in the present about how those help us to navigate the contemporary citizenship and migration nexus. Definitely. Sorry, I'm just thinking, I'm going to save it. I'm going to save it for later. I was going to say something else, but I'm going to, I'm going to hold back and bring um, George in. So George, you came, you came to the UK two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. When you told me you came two years ago, I was embarrassed. I was like, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I'm so sorry. The things that you've had to witness in this country. I mean, it's always been a bit chaotic, but it feels very chaotic at the moment. Um, Anyway, so when I when when um, you told me that I was like, oh, wow. Like, what do you think about like notions of Britishness, Englishness? Like, how has that how have you kind of observed that as someone that's not really grown up here or spent much of your adult life here? Mm, yeah, so it's interesting how the view I held before coming and then the view, especially after doing this uh, research with Michaela. Um, and so I must say that before coming to the UK, there is a very common uh, view of what's uh, British, which is basically English. So like there is this kind of uh, matching of Britishness with Englishness solely. And I know many people who like would still refer to the UK, refer to Britain somehow and just say England even and then have this image of this very stereotypical posh image of the, a white person, you know. Um, so to an extent, I did 
uh, hold this image myself before coming here uh, somehow. But then, of course, um, coming here and doing the research with Michaela, I realized how much broader this is, uh, like, I mean, Britishness is in terms of, uh, you know, colonialism, basically, and how this history uh, is very complex. It's very broad and it's very global. Uh, but then the other day, <laughs> in fact, I was uh, talking with uh, some English friends and we were just discussing uh, migration and um, such kinds of issues, basically. And I mean, generally, they're open minded people. But still, at some point, they told me uh, that, uh, you know, here we are trying to integrate people. And they said, who? Uh, Where? <laughs> <laughs> But, How? <laughs> but that's the thing. What integrate refers to is, exa- again, this Englishness, this whiteness. So they said that in their neighborhood, there are like the their Indian families, for instance, living in their neighborhood. And then immediately I realized, but they don't even consider that these people who are talking about might probably be British themselves, yeah. right? Because of what British history is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this again brings us to what basically Michaela said uh about uh, Gaminda and about this idea of, uh, you know, people growing and thinking they're migrants or other people thinking they're migrants. And, yeah, this image of whiteness, mm, I guess. Mm, mm. Going to continue on um, the Gaminda Bambra strand. Big up Gaminda. We love Gaminda. Um, <laughs> and thinking about one of the things that comes across in the whole, in the, in the entirety of the podcast, Mikola, and that is you trying to speak back to understandings of Britishness inside of the nation state and actually understanding it as something that is develops and is legislated within in an, in an empire context um so one thing it would get it would be really good for you to talk about is the very recent constructions of citizenship and how the that has tried to yeah create borders around well has created borders around the empire and positioning things more within the nation state um, even though, yeah, it, we've always been everywhere. Well, they've always been everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that really kind of blew my mind is is that the the it, it, it comes from Rika Karatani's book, Defining British Citizenship, um, where she points out that the current definition of British citizenship, which applies to people um, with links to the UK, um, so not everybody born in the UK actually is a British citizen. I'd just like you to sit with that for a minute. But but people who have links to the UK, um, specific types of links, um, is only 40 years old. So it's basically only as old as me. It comes in in 1981 that we define British citizenship as something that is for people who are born in the UK who have those links to the UK through through family and through ancestry and in particular forms of way of ways and to me that was like i wonder how many people actually know that mm. um but beyond that actually the introduction of an idea of a citizen is very late in the in britain so it doesn't really come into law until 1948 and the reason it comes into law in 1948 is partly to do with what's happening in the wider empire at the time And all around the empire, what you've got is like Australia going, oh, we want to control our borders. We want to stop um, the migration of, and I've got my my hands in quotation marks, Asiatics. Um, We want to keep these people out. So basically they're saying we want to define who is allowed to be here and who we are going to, and whose interests we're going to govern. And this is happening across various of the colonies, particularly the settler colonies. And then... Britain decides that it's going to have to respond by introducing citizenship itself, so transforming, moving away from this idea of British subjects, which you can hear about in episode two, which is coming out next week um, on the 29th with Devyani Prabhat, what this idea of subjecthood was um, and, and, and kind of what then happens in terms of introducing this idea of citizenship. Now, interestingly, in 1948, when they introduced citizenship, the categories that they have are citizens of the UK and colonies. That's one category on its own. So this includes, in my family, my grandmother born in Hong Kong and my grandfather born in Wiltshire. So born 9,370 miles apart, I worked out. But yet they share this citizenship. 
Um, and the other category is citizens of the Commonwealth, which is about those parts of the British world that are becoming independent nations. Um, so at the start in 1948, all of those people who are citizens of the UK and colonies all have the same rights. It's mad, isn't it? No, it is mad. It is mad. Because I remember, again, like coming back to you reading my PhD, and I'd said something about um, my participants being from the Caribbean and being like British citizens. You were like, no, no, no. They were, what is it, British citizens of the colon... No, British... They were citizens of the UK and colonies. Yeah, like, it's... It's just crazy that there's that, there's that there's so many variations. And in episode two, one of the things I think comes across really well is thinking about locating um, post-war Britain and citizenship. Um, what you guys do is so powerful in looking at how um, Britain needed, um, well, the invitation wasn't one of complete welcome um which is another way that the podcast is kind of sort to disrupt some of the um uh zeitgeist type issues of saying like oh the Windrush generation were invited over actually like there was adverts put out to be like do you want to come do the post-war labor effort we've got a shortage but there was lots of people within parliament within the wider public that didn't want too many people come in and then when people came um the you I, I really like that you spoke about 1981 you get a series of legislations that are kind of drawing back those rights um like I feel like lots of people on this on this in this seminar or um, podcast or listening now will have family members that were that were affected by that change in 1981 I know my dad was and I think that yeah, it's just one of the really powerful things that the that the podcast does is you re- very much locate this legislation, the citizenship within the wider um, public um, domain of control, but racialization, the racialization as well. Yeah, I think too many people basically. Sorry, just one one more thing to say. <laughs> too like you say in the pod, in episode two, they didn't expect that many people to come. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think there's that. But I also think what's really interesting, and George can confirm this from going back in the archives, is that, you know, I think sometimes, and, and this is what's really fascinating about looking back, I think sometimes what can happen is that we can um, find ourselves in a position where we think that everything was always incredibly um, black and white. Um, from the point of view of, you know, back in the day, everybody was incredibly, uh, you know, all of that move was like all parliamentarians were saying, keep them out, keep them away. And actually what I found really hopeful in looking at the archives was the fact that there was always, there were always people who were going, well, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. If you do this, it might not happen now, but in a few years time, 30, 40 years, this is what you will produce. So you find people, for example, talking about the British Nationality Act and saying, you know, you're introducing this legislation and this legislation, which ab- about like not automatically granting citizenship to all children who are born in the United Kingdom is going to make children stateless. Mm. Mm. So there are people in Parliament saying this is what's going to happen. And yet they push through the legislation as it is at the time. And now... Now we're seeing the consequences of that. And that's something I discuss with Imogen Tyler in episode Mm -hmm. five, Mm. um, the kind of production of statelessness among children who were born in the UK. Sorry, I'm just I'm I always when whenever I'm talking, whenever I'm talking to anyone about this stuff, particularly citizenship, migration, borders and the histories like it just really angers me because I'm like, there were people that were telling you and actually, no, you didn't care. You just wanted to be get things done in the way you wanted to get things done then. And like both sides of the house as well. I think it's really, I think it's really powerful you bringing up what's in the archive in terms of people saying, don't do this. I'm, because sometimes I'm a bit cynical. I'm always looking at like, what horrible things that people sound like. See, see. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm off on a tangent there. Um, George, I had a question for you. Um, what did... Oh, no, wait, hang on. Okay. What did the podcast open up for you as someone who has only just recently settled in the UK? I know we spoke about that a little bit, but, like, you obviously have done quite a lot of the archival work. You feature yeah. on the podcast. Like, yeah, what's what are some of the things or the headlines, some of the things you've learned about? 
I mean, I think also with what Michaela just mentioned, especially about um, this way in which uh, British citizenship basically came into existence uh, in terms of borders and control, rather than in terms of something that you have in a constitution, you have uh, the rights of citizens that are protected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that was very interesting for me as someone just recently moving to the UK, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, it helped me kind of understand a bit more what's happening right now, which I'm in a way part of. I mean, we are all part of. But for, so for, instance, for instance, I'm Greek. So I moved here two years ago, right uh, just a bit before Brexit was finalized, kind of. And I got pre-settled status. But then I am, I am part of somehow of this experience of uncertainty, of this experience of, and to have friends who are even more than me, uh, friends who just moved here now with a visa or something. Uh, so uh, this kind of hostile environment, I guess, overall. And then this kind of a way of co controlling borders even more, keeping people out even more, or basically not j exactly keeping people out, but controlling who's coming in and who's not coming in. And then this, again, relates to a certain image of whiteness to a very extent, which also relates, you know, with ethnicity, some uh, to, a, yeah. So basically how this is not something that's new at all, but it's something that has keep on happening um, throughout the years. And it's just increasing and increasing even more like this, this restriction. Uh, and yeah, I don't know where this will lead, but <laughs> I think that's something that I've I kept. Yeah, no, completely. I feel like I think about this sort of thing all the time. Like, what's the plan? Um, what is their plan? If they're going to continue perpetuating this PR campaign of Britain as this mm -hmm. island and there is only certain people that belong here and don't belong here, like, in terms of how the nation state functions, what's the plan? Because you can't you can't operate without your quote unquote um people that have always contributed or been extracted from within the empire and Mikla I kind of went round the wrong way with this question but I think I, I hope sorry sorry ADHD um, <laughs> but, um could you talk a little bit about the PR the Britain's PR campaign and I I, I see Britain's PR campaign as be, um, being led as an island nation being led by yeah the government but also some people in academia um, <laughs> say no names um, <laughs> yeah let's can not you, mention that can you talk about <laughs> So I, I think, I, I mean, you, you, this, this idea of the PR campaign as Britain as an island has been going on for a really long time. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the important thing to bear in mind. So you start to see it kind of, you know, as Britain is politically decolonizing, and I, I choose those words very, very carefully, in the kind of the middle of the 20th century, because basically all of these other parts of the British Empire are saying, well, hang on a second, we want to be self-governing, we want to be self-determining. It's like, oh, you know, so so how are we going to redefine ourselves? Oh, I know. We'll redefine ourselves around these islands um, in, you know, in the North Sea, essentially. Um, and, and, and the kind of irony about this kind of the shrinking borders is that there are still parts of the world that are colonies. Um, and um, so it's kind of like it's reconstructed itself as a nation um, through these kind of forms of immigration control that it introduces through the Commonwealth Immigration Acts, which were all about making those citizens of the UK and colonies um, into aliens for the purposes of immigration control if they wanted to come to the UK. Very, very messy um, in, in respect to that. Um, so it, it, it kind of, um, so, so it does that and then it kind of closes the loophole, which is, you know, these people were essentially citizens who were also migrants. I mean, those two things, you know, in, in the public imagination, I think those two things are incompatible. How can you be a citizen and a migrant in respect to the same state? But Britain managed to do this at that point in time. Um, so what you see is Britain kind of redefining its borders actually before that process of decolonization is over, before it's complete. I mean, some people might even say it's not entirely complete now, but, you know, um, and at the same time, you've got people who are in these other parts of the world where Britain still has borders. So Hong Kong, at the same time as... Um, at the same time as Britain is introducing these immigration controls, which keep Hong Kongers out, is also on the edge of Britain's border with China. Mm. And you get all sorts of things happening in Hong Kong at, uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s around refugees from mainland China, and then later through the Vietnam um, refugee crisis, where Britain basically uses Hong Kong to offshore 
um, the refugee issue around people fleeing Vietnam um, at the same time as Hong Kong is not being able to enter the UK. So so it, it's kind of odd because what then happens is that, you know, it, it kind of um, preempts Britain as a nation. And it's been remarkably successful as a campaign, mm. you know. I grew up in the 1980s, as you know, um, and I grew up in a household of people who were looking towards when Hong Kong would be have its sovereignty handed um, over to China from Britain. And I think that at that time, already what we had in kind of critical scholarship was people talking about Britain as though it was a post-colonial nation. Mm. And so I, I think there's like that contradiction, that bifurcation there. That's um, quite. Um, sorry, I'm using very complex words to say something. No, you're not. Very simple. No, you're not. I was just about to say, <laughs> Mikla, you know so much, and you are like so good at, <laughs> at detailing it. So I, I mean, but I, I suppose I suppose what I'm trying to say is like that it was a very successful campaign of forgetting Britain's imperial past, saying, oh, you know, this is the future, the British nation, and in that process, you know, with so many excellent scholars have have said you know this was a process that redefined belonging in britain in a way that excluded a multi-ethnic population in the empire but also in the uk it's powerful stuff i mean i want to come I'm, i want to just say it and maybe we can bring it into this next question one of the things that i when i'm trying to give a kind of uh, generous reading or analysis of what people know about this stuff when you're talking, Mikola, sometimes I'm like, do people realise the violences of citizenship? Like, do people actually, like, people within Britain that don't experience the border in the way that some people do and don't experience citizenship precarity in, in, um, in the same way that others do, do they realise, like, how embedded this kind of, this history is, this these processes of racialization, exclusion? Like, do people understand... And like my generous reading is like people don't realise this, hence why we kind of engage in this public sociology, sociological praxis. But maybe they do know and maybe people do think actually there should be a hierarchy and I do but I belong here more than you do. Sorry, I've gone off I've, I've gone off subject a bit, but sometimes when we talk about this, I'm like, it's so obviously just shocking. Do people like? Is it? Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, I suppose that I suppose my question would be: Do people realise that British nationality legislation stratifies yes. the population of people who, on paper, share a nationality, Britishness, um, into six different categories with different rights? And I suspect that if people took that as a starting point, rather than assuming that British citizenship was something that that meant the same thing for everybody who had a nationality status, then we might be having different conversations. But I think that most people are not aware of that mm. process that produced that because that idea of citizenship as permitting, you know, as having these kind of rights, as being about democracy, um, is so strong and pervasive. Nobody's re- People don't really necessarily look underneath the covers of of what British citizenship is today, um, which is you know I, I mean again I go back to Rika Karatani because what she said is so is so inspiring. But she basically refers to contemporary British citizenship, so the citizenship that you and I have our passports of, which no longer is EU citizenship. I just mentioned that. <laughs> um, but she basically says this is what this gives you is the right to live in the United Kingdom. Mm. Now, those of you who are here, and I can see um, that my friend Debbie Williams is here, who who runs a fantastic organisation called Brexpats Hear Our Voice, um, is, um, you know, you know very, very well, Debbie, and others of you um, who, who live in Europe, that, you know, British citizenship doesn't even come with the right to vote. Mm. You know, I mean, you and I have yeah, spent yeah, a lot yeah. of time Sorry, talking like, about this. Yeah, it's it's mad. And you, you like, I spent so much time in Hansard looking at the debates on this. Yeah. And there's so many MPs that are like, well, no, if you leave, you shouldn't get to vote. And then there's other MPs. And it's really, there's not necessarily like a Labour, Tory, Lib Dem sort of an um, alliance on this stuff. It's very split. And it is interesting about how how many MPs kind of back the notion that, 
or have always already backed the notion that once you leave, you should not get to vote. So I think that there are lots of assumptions about what a citizen is and isn't. There's a lot of idealisation about what it means to be a citizen. That when we start to look carefully at British citizenship, Mm. you're like, well, actually, hold on a second. And I I mean, I think that that kind of goes to some of the early conversations that George and I were having when I started to put together the podcast, you know, coming from a very different citizenship regime and thinking about what rights you have as a Greek citizen and, you know, um, compared with what rights you may or may not have as a British citizen. Mm -hmm. And I think the last few years, what's interesting, I think, is the way in which certainly with the British populations of people that I've been working with who live in Europe, actually what Brexit did was it actually opened up those conversations to say, well, hold on a second, how is this happening? You know, and what does this mean? Why is it that we don't have the right to vote anymore? You know, and, mm. and that starts to open up conversations around citizenship and migration. I mean, and not not to not to disagree with you, Mikola, but just thinking about the work that we did together in who was surprised mm. at reactions to of rights course. being yeah. being taken away. And like I, alongside yourself, interviewed um, people with British citizenship that were um, but people of colour that lived within um, lived in Europe. And their their perceptions or understandings of what was happening with Brexit or the conversation was like, where have you been? Like, Yeah, and I think that's really important yeah. because, of course, you know, we're talking about, when we look at citizenship, we're talking about racialised inequalities. Yeah. And there's some people who, despite the fact that they've had that passport, um, had that citizenship, and I, I don't want to conflate passports and citizenship as one thing, they're, they're not the same thing. Well, spoiler for the next question. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, I, I think that, you know, when we when we think about that, there are some people who, who can have all of the documents that say they are a citizen and yet they will still be questioned about whether they really belong. Mm. And I think that that points to how citizenship is caught up in the politics of race and migration in Britain and it has been for 50, 60, 70 years. Mm. So I, I guess, Mick, I'm going to come to you first and then... George, it would be good if you came in on this. Why podcast this? Why podcasts? I mean, I know why, because I love podcasts. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> why? Why podcast this? Um, so this is really interesting. So this podcast comes out of a project that I did for a British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship, which was called Britain and its Overseas whoop, whoop. Citizens. Sorry, don't just like skirt <laughs> over that. That's a big deal. British Academy. <laughs> so, so I held this fellowship. I was really fortunate to hold it from um, 2020 to the beginning of this year. Hmm. Um, and... Um, the idea, you know, it was written into it that I would do a podcast because, you know, like you, I'm I'm a big fan of podcasting and I podcasted all the way through that that mm. Brexit project about British citizens living in the EU. Um, and I found it a really useful way of really challenging myself, communicating uh, research findings um, and, and actually communicating with the people who were being directly impacted by the things I was studying. And so I started to do a bit of market research as you do you know like who is talking about citizenship in podcasts and it turned out that nobody really was Mm. I mean there's there is a great there's a great podcast by um I think it's for the I can't remember is it for the BBC I think it's for the BBC that um that does follow somebody's journey through applying for citizenship and she goes into conversation with all sorts of Mm. um all sorts of people about that but actually looking at this kind of history um looking at the kind of sociology of citizenship there really didn't seem to be very much in the public domain. And I thought, well, actually, if I'm going to do a podcast, I shouldn't just I shouldn't start from just focusing on Britain and its relationship mm-hmm. to its overseas citizens, but probably do a little bit of myth busting from the start about, you know, some of these these kind of un, lesser known stories, let's say, about how we got here. Um, why podcast? I just love podcasting. No, um, <laughs> I do. I'm genuinely concerned about how we reach out from the university and engage people in the work that we're doing I mean you ask that question of well do people really not know Mm. Um, and I think that we have to remember that we have a really really um, we have a really quite exclusive media machine Mm -hmm. Um, and 
that, that kind of does try to shut down some of those, well, those conversations aren't there. So if we can put some other information out there and we can we can ask people to engage with us over those, it's not just me broadcasting mm-hmm. my, my amazing views on everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it's a really, really good format, particularly of engaging younger people um, and also engaging people, people around the world. It makes it accessible. It's not behind a paywall. Mm. This is produced by me. It's freely accessible. Mm, mm. Um, you know, so um, I think that that's, that's all part, part of the rationale for doing it. Um, I think as well, just to say, I, I agree with you in terms of emphasising the sort of public element and like sort of democratising information. But I do think like for me personally, like, um, one of my supervisors, Les Back, said to me um, about podcasting in terms of my academic writing that I should see the things as like interlinked yeah. and like I should, when I'm writing, like, I'm not I'm not a natural academic writer. I've got I'm dyslexic and dyspraxic, but like try and write how you podcast and like making those two things like interrelated within how I approach academia have been fundamental to my capacity to become a scholar do you know what I mean so like I know that's not the same for everyone with podcasting (laughs) but like I see podcasting as very much related to how I write now as well yeah, I think I, I think I also see it like that, and I remember our, our mutual friends. No, I friends. think you, I think no, honestly, I think you do. I can see how your writing has now been informed by podcasts. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, our mutual friend Karen O'Reilly said that um, since since I'd been podcasting, my writing had become decluttered and, yeah, and much yeah. more straightforward. I mean, she's one of the most straight talking, straight writing academics. Yeah, I she's know. such a clear writer. <laughs> um, but that does not come easily to me. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, so it's really helped me to clarify a lot of my ideas mm-hmm. as well, um, that process of podcasting. But I didn't want to make it all about myself. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, but um, but yeah, and I think like this this particular podcast, this series um, has taken a lot longer to produce than I had anticipated, and I. I think that the reason for that is I've spent a long time um, thinking about you know, what you actually need to do to make knowledge that you think is so self-evident to you um, accessible to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it is, it's much more carefully scripted than anything else I've done before. It's so well produced, by the way. I love it. Like, as someone like me and Tisa, you know, we just rock up and do like, we sort of chat. But like, to, to listen to a sociological podcast that's been put together in this very kind of, it's so neat and precise. Like, it's brilliant. It really, really is. Thank you. That's really, really kind. Um, because it has been a labour of love. No, it has. <laughs> so... No, I know you've been working on it for such a long time. And and George, is there anything you want to say about like uh, podcasting and public sociology? Yeah, I mean, I mean, as you said, this podcast I think is for sure uh, an academically informed yet accessible so accessible uh, podcast and I think that's very important and then another thing uh, like Michaela briefly mentioned that is the myth busting and I think that's another aspect uh, in this podcast podcast that's very important this way of moving through history and then myth busting things that we think are obvious so for instance I just remember while coming here today um, that you know we've talked so far about how bridgesness have been has been racialized uh, through history but it has also been gendered for instance mm-hmm. so uh it was i think like until before 1948 was the national debut of 1948 i'm not sure 1981 it's as late as 1981, what you're just about to say. Ah, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Um, that basically women who, it was that before that, women who would marry a, quote, alien mm. uh, would would lose their citizenship. Mm. And they wouldn't British. be able to pass it on to their children. Exactly. Which, I mean, this is like, wow. <laughs> I want to swear, but I'm not going to. Um, well, it turns it's, out that, 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 that for some categories, some yeah. some people who have particular categories of citizenship, that gendered dimension is still an issue. And that's one of the things that's kind of at the heart of some of the changes through the Nationality and Borders Bill. I support. But we're in 2021. Yeah. And that's still there. And I mean, on that note, thinking about citizenship, I, I know we, we touched on it earlier, but could we talk a little bit m- more about passports? Um and how citizenships and passports have been created to stop people. And I kind of want to 
before you answer the question, um, Mikla and George, um, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago with um, legendary Corinda Bambra and she was talking about like the his- histories of, yeah, bureaucracy around um, Britain and citizenship. And she was talking about the passport as a means, as, as possibly thinking it, thinking about it as a means to stop in wealthy white Europeans going abroad, going abroad and extracting and I'd never really thought about it like that. I was like, oh, yeah, like this is a type of bureaucracy that if it wasn't used in a way that um, inflicts racialized harm at the border consistently, that's not, she wasn't sort of, she wasn't ignoring that fact, but she was saying one thing that we need to understand is what can bureaucracy actually do in terms of stopping people that will harm and extract and take? Um, can we think about passports in that way? Um and I thought that was really powerful. I never really thought about like that before. And then listening to your show, I was like, "Oh, yeah, yeah." I think that. Um, I mean, I understand. Obviously, I wasn't there um, <laughs> at that particular talk, but I, I think that that's that's a kind of question about um, whether borders should be abolished, isn't mm, it? Mm. And it's kind of a question about well, if you abolish the borders, does it actually abolish the fundamental inequalities in the world? Yeah, are rich people just gonna yeah carry on flying, extracting, and so I what think that I, I think that that's kind of the thing, which is that again, it's that kind of like, well, does this provide the solution to the problem that you're talking about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The problem that you're talking about is global inequality, and how that manifests in a whole range of ways. And so, if you just like make us make it a borderless world, does that mean that everybody will just be able to move freely? Of course, mm-hmm. it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that that's that's really important. Now, this point though about the difference between citizenships and passports. Passports have existed in a variety of forms for a long period of time, maybe not as that kind of not necessarily as sanctioned by the nation state, but, you know, local local mayors or or local areas. And they're basically a way of the authorities controlling the means of mobility. And this is what we get from John Torpy's excellent work on the invention of the passport that actually, you know, this is states or authorities controlling movement. And the reason that it was important to control movement was because of controlling the movement of labour as well, Mm. or or keeping the labour in sometimes. Mm. So, so yeah. um, Just to be clear for the audience, we are not being apathetic on the violence of the borders at all. We're just talking about how rich people are going to be rich in and if we're like, and they will carry on. Yeah. yeah, so um, is there an... Oh, go on, go on George. Yeah, yeah. no, I was just thinking that, um, yeah, I think that this notion that how passports uh, are actually meant not to allow people to move, but to stop people moving is one of the other myth-busting things. Mm. And then also, like, uh, you then have to uh, kind of scrutinize the, the, the purposes, like the biases be- behind who is stopped moving. Mm-hmm. So again, to bring this into, like, a like what we experience today. Uh, actually, I just remembered, Michaela, of a Twitter feed you did a few months ago. Uh, you know, while this, uh, there was so many stories in the media about uh, after, a bit after Brexit, like people being, uh, being held and going to detention centers. But it was, what was interesting, it's like which kind of stories made it to the media mm-hmm. compared to the numbers of people coming from different countries in relation to Europe, that is, but then so basically, people from Eastern Europe. There were more people who would be detained who were coming from Eastern Europe. But these people, the stories of these people, were not making it into the uh, yeah. the, the ra- public media. The racialization of the of Europeanness yeah. is so interesting. Well, and, yeah. and also appalling, obviously. Um, so this was a, this is the case, and I, I suppose this is where where the kind of work on European citizenship becomes quite interesting in terms of how that itself is stratified mm-hmm. racially um, and by class. And and what turns out to be happening is despite the fact that we heard lots of stories at the beginning of the year about Greek and Spanish and Italians being stopped at the borders, actually, when you look at the numbers, first of all, the majority of those people who are stopped at the borders eventually are let into the UK. But when you look at the Romanians, mm. you're talking mm. about thousands of people being stopped at the border and returned to Romania. Mm. And that had been happening before Brexit, mm. and it's just ramped up after Brexit. So um, European citizenship, this is supposedly, you know, in in most people's imaginations, this kind of equalising status. Mm. Um, And of course, you know, there are all sorts of conversations to be had about what European citizenship is as a citizenship. 
um, is ha- has been stratified um, for a long time, um, and 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 that's becoming visible through some of those border controls. I'm aware that we we we, we could chat for hours. I know. What, what's the time, what is the time saying actually? By the, the way, the time is saying about five o'clock. So. Wait, does that mean we've got to stop? It means that we could have probably one more question. Okay, we should do you want to over do you want talk about useless answer. citizenship or global Britain? <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness, where to start with that? Um, so I oh I don't know. You choose. Um, we spoke a lot about the hierarchies, um, colonial mechanisms of control and order. We spoke about that kind of. So we talk about we talk about, talk about the news and we talked about why does all this matter in terms of thinking about citizenship migration and global Britain? Do you feel like we've covered that? Um, hmm, interesting. Have we covered that? It might come up in the Q and A actually. It's quite like <laughs> that's like the thing, isn't it? Like the zeitgeist. But what about useless citizenship? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 this, this, this description of some statuses in British nationality law. So, for example, the British nationals overseas. Um, the can you give some examples of some of those? Yeah, places? yeah. So, so the British nationals overseas is a category mm-hmm. that was exclusively given to the people of Hong Kong mm-hmm. to kind of continue to signal their relationship to Britain Mm. as former colonial citizens while at the same time recognising that they were now under the sovereignty of the Chinese. So people who were um, born before 1997 Mm -hmm. in Hong Kong were eligible to register to become British nationals overseas um, uh, on the 1st of July 1997. And really what this did was it gave people a passport. So it gave them a passport that basically attested to their right to residence in Hong Kong. And it gave them consular support if they travelled anywhere in the world except for Britain and China. Mm. Um, It didn't allow them entry into the UK although um, to work and live, although it gave them some slightly enhanced rights in terms of how long they were allowed to visit. Um, so some lawyers just call these, you know, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're not, it's not even called citizenship. It's called British nationals overseas. That's, that's, that's it. And can you just say, just to finish, Mikola, can you talk about um, what that means now? Yeah. So, so what that means now is that it was kind of slightly empty of meaning and significance, to be honest. And, and even among, I think, people who held it, it was kind of empty of meaning and significance. And yet it's kind of been reactivated. Mm. So it's Mm. kind of been given and infused with a new meaning because that status is at the heart of the current provisions for Hong Kongers to come to the UK, to migrate to and settle in the UK through the Hong Kong BNO visa scheme. Mm. So it's kind of been reactivated in this way that nobody could have anticipated. Um, And it's been reactivated precisely because... Britain has judged that China has breached the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Um, obviously, China don't agree with that. But, um, mm. you know, as far as they're concerned, Britain's relationship with Hong Kong was over and done with in 1997 and they have no right to monitor what's happening in Hong Kong. So it's kind of been mobilised um, in the current hostile environment in the UK. And it kind of looks odd because it looks yeah. really... I mean, you're talking about like three... Three million people potentially, mm. who actually it's more than that, who might be eligible to come, mm. um, and it looks really generous. And there are kind of yeah. sixty, nearly sixty-five thousand people have actually applied for this visa scheme to date since the beginning of the year. And so, how do we sort of square that circle in terms of like pushing back against reactionaries who are, who are, who would say th- who will use this in a way? Well, we'll racialize this process and talk about this being an, this being something exceptional, and then understanding that alongside or receiving that alongside of what George was just saying in terms of thinking about the racialization of Eastern Europeans, thinking about the Windrush scandal. Like, how do we as public sociologists push back against understanding this as something which uh, or receiving this in a way? that isn't divisive and actually understanding it within Britain's broader political, like, I'm, I want, I need, I need to, I can't swear, can I? Broader political <laughs> BS. Um, 
I think it's really complicated. Yeah. So I think the first thing to say is how are we in this situation in the first place? Yeah. And we're in this situation in the first place because Britain removed the rights of those Hong Kongers at a time before China was was about to take Mm -hmm. over sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you see this happening um, in 1981 through the British Nationality Act. And of course, Britain is just about to go into negotiations with China and that does shape the British Nationality Act. But at the same time as, so British, um, so the Hong Kongers, so the British Chinese, the British Falklanders, the British Gibraltarians, they're all made into British dependent territory citizens. Mm. But then in the early 1980s, the British government kind of steps, you know, retracts that BDTC status for the Falklanders and the Gibraltarians and gives them full British citizenship. So white populations. Yeah, I was mm. going to say that's, that's <laughs> racialised. Um, yeah, are, are made are made. Um, yeah, are made full British citizens. And yet, when Tiananmen Square happens in 1981, and mm. all of the protests erupt in, erupt in Hong Kong, Britain offers 50,000 um, citizenships. Uh, on competition to people um, living, still living in the colony. And this, I think, links back to that question of like passports to stop people moving, because actually, even at the time, when you look through the transcripts of Parliament, what they're saying is, you know, these are passports to make sure that people stay in Hong Kong. Mm. They're not passports to make people move. It's about giving people security mm. to know that they've got somewhere to go ultimately, but they'll stay put for now to continue stay to serve there. the Don't economy. Don't actually come. So, and I should say, I, I mean, this is this is, yeah. this is at the heart of Kathleen Paul's argument when she mm-hmm. talks about the Hong Kongers. So that's not my, my unique <laughs> take on it. So I think that that's the first thing to say. If we look at that history, there's, there's that. But I think that there's also the case that well, actually when you look at the history of how the Hong Kongers have been dealt with in respect to Britain's citizenship and migration, Migration law, they've always been an exception. Mm. And I would ask the question of what the work of exception actually does mm. in that broader context of ordering, racially ordering the world. Because I think that's that's when we start to see um, that kind of mobilization of the narratives about who's deserving and who's not deserving yeah. and why. And I, I think there's there was a fantastic Guardian article. Um, by a by a, a writer an author who writes on Singapore called oh, I can't I can't quite remember what his name is but he points out that you know we really do need to be skeptical of the narrative that's come out around the Hong Kong BNA visa hundred percent yeah around you know actually the Hong Kongers being the good migrants that Britain needs at the moment because otherwise we're buying into the whole narrative of the hostile environment. Now this is not me saying that Britain shouldn't do anything for the Hong Kongers. It's just it's more to do with kind of asking the question of actually within the context of the hostile environment, within that longer history, what is this particular narration doing and what does that tell us about the construction of citizenship and migration in Britain? And one final point on that, I think that also like, you know, it's kind of that that visa has been upheld as as part of the Home Office's longstanding humanitarian agenda um, to providing haven to people around the world. And I, I mean, I hope you can hear my sarcasm because it definitely is there. Um, so so they get upheld, the Hong Kongers and the Ugandan and Kenyan Asians get upheld as evidence of conservative governments offering these kind of safe havens and saving the world essentially <laughs> through their mechanisms. And I think, you know... That they believe that, though, don't they? Like, me and Tisa talk about this all the time. I'm like, do they actually think they're good people? I'm like, how does that happen? And Tisa always says to me, hubris. <laughs> so there's hubris, but there's also, like, when you actually start to look into the details of the Hong Kong BNO visa, the fact that the BNO status is only available to people who were born before 1997 mm. and their dependents, mm. provided they come and bring their dependents with them, actually, the majority of the people... Um, Given that that uprising was students and youth, quite a lot of those people are not even even going to be able to use that route in order to come into the UK. And they've been told to use the Tier 5 route, which is the um, Youth Mobility Scheme, which is a two-year scheme with no route to settlement. You're not allowed to get married, have children... Um, or do anything like that. I mean, that's that's Elsa Uman's um, argument mm. um, that she's made very, very clear in her piece for Discover Society on this, or through asylum, mm. essentially. Mm. So, you know, it's it's not quite what it seems. Mm. 
powerful stuff. Apologies, I just went on. <laughs> no, no, you did it. It's really good. So, should we have questions now? Are there any questions? Yeah, we probably should have some questions. If there are any questions, if you pop them into the chat, I know that that Michael's kind of channeling them through. Michael, Michael's in the stu- in the stu- in the Lancaster studio. I <laughs> say, so. Um, I can already see that we've got a question from Debbie Williams, which is which is how I knew that she was here, so I could do a shout out to her, um, asking us if we're planning on publishing a historic timeline about changes to British nationality, subjecthood, and citizenship um, that that could be shareable as an infographic or a meme. I don't know, Debbie. I think it might be a good idea, but I'm also worried that it actually isn't compressible into an infographic mm-hmm. or a meme. Mm-hmm. It's so it's very very complicated. Um, uh, and and I'm I'm yeah I have to ha- let me let me think on it Debbie <laughs> so I think is is probably the best way of of kind of putting it. We can make a map maybe. A big yeah, George, I can see you. Know, I, can, I can see your little creative eyes in the corner there, being like, "Hmm, I wonder." Yeah, I can see. Yeah, actually, I'm sitting next to like a really talented artist. Yeah. And suddenly, you know, it just kind of comes to me like that. Um, are there any other questions? Stunned silence. Can you see, like, what can you see on the screen? I can see the live event Q&As, and there's just that one, but I've lost my mouse, so so let's have a look. What's going on? Oh, the Commonwealth has come up a few times in this conversation. Um, and as someone who first came to the UK through Commonwealth Scholarship, I'd be interested to hear about how you see the ongoing practices around a community of Commonwealth nations, and e.g. academic scholarships linked to that as affecting some of these dynamics around citizenship that you've been discussing. Can we just big up Barbados for removing the Queen? (laughs) If we're talking about the Commonwealth. (laughs) Am I allowed to say that? I've said it. Um, Yeah, well, yeah, you can say that. (laughs) I I mean, I don't know. Um, um, Thank you, Alison. That's a a really interesting question. I, I mean, I think that one of the things that's really come come up for me recently, obviously studying Brexit, um, is the kind of um, question about how the Commonwealth has been mobilised, how it's been narrated as the kind of new alternative to Britain being in Europe. And, you know, I, I think that it's really important to think about what that narrative does and 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 to think, I suppose, think of... I'm going to say think about it separately from 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 the possibilities that it opens up for people. But I don't know if that's just fudging the question, Mm. really. Mm. Um, But certainly, I I mean, again, I suppose it it does link to this, which is, you know, I, I do think it's rather. I don't want to say convenient. I do think the fact that the first bespoke visa scheme that the British government opened up after Britain formally exited the transition period um and um left the eu properly is um is one that is towards its former colonial subjects in hong kong i think that's really significant in terms of and of course there are all sorts of things that come together um, you know um to explain the timing and all of this kind of thing but I think that kind of reanimation of its colonial and Commonwealth relations, mm. which I think we're going to see a lot more of through the emerging immigration plan, is is really significant in terms of how Britain is trying to reposition itself in the world at this point in time. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, probably I didn't say it as clearly as I could, but, you know, Britain's constantly engaged in this project of repositioning itself. And this is a moment where it's repositioning itself because it's left the European Union is essentially becoming a much smaller um, state. Um, so it's really interesting that now it's reaching out through global Britain to what? To the former British world. Mm. Um, I, I think that's really interesting for me. OK, so Michael... Um, Michael has taken his liberty as the the moderator of the discussion to follow up on Debbie's point, um, re a meme timeline. Is this a tension in public sociology between making research sufficiently accessible and engaging versus scholarly 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 integrity and complexity? Actually, I think this is a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm going to ask Chantel about that. Um, is it Michael? Yeah. I don't think I agree, Michael, with with 
with that tension. I think you can be, as in, I I think that is a tension that we are able to uh, to deal with, and I think we should. I think the real question is, can all scholars, can all public, so can all sociologists do that? No. Can some of us? Yes. Can some sociologists spend more time on the scholarly, scholar, the complexities of scholarly praxis? Yes. Is there some public sociologist which can marry the two? Yes. So that's just my my personal opinion. Um, I mean, George might have some thoughts too as a kind of visual practitioner as well, because you've been doing that work for a while, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, a diff- so it's different when you write a text, for instance, a sociological text about something. And then when you create a visual, there's a certain process of abstraction where, when you go to the visual and then... Um, I think that the the visual part uh, is more of triggering uh, a kind of interest for people to look further into something. So it can be that, I mean, I think visuals are very important because they do communicate some basic information and they do highlight, you know, uh, import like aspects uh, for people and they do raise questions. But then if you want to have a deeper understanding of something, you would have to uh, dive deeper into it somehow, whether that's a text or a longer, like even, you know, a, a, a podcast or a film, something that's more long, <laughs> that's longer. I think so, that, yeah. I think also, like, George, sorry, do you want to come in, Mika? I was just going to say, so, so for you, the visual is an entry point, inviting people into a bigger conversation. Oh, nice, yeah, that's a good yeah. point. I think that we also, just to be more generous to Michael's point, I think particularly in this kind of we're tired of we're tired we're tired of experts era, we do tread this fine line between trying to make um, scholarship accessible, being public sociologists, and the sort of turn towards anti intellectualism. So, like, yeah, like, we do have... To, I think it is important to have scholarship and knowledge production that's complex and within the academy for the purpose of doing that. But I think when it comes to social issues, which are pressing and urgent, and have always been pressing and urgent, I do think that there are some of us that should take up that... that, that what I see as a, a responsibility as a scholar and a public sociologist who can engage in a production of knowledge which is quote-unquote accessible or attempts to be accessible should do that so yeah I do think I think we I think it's really important that we keep keep pushing up keep pushing against anti-intellectualism by making the case for the academy but also keep thinking about what we can do as public sociologists to bring the knowledge outside of that and how that exists within a long history of people that have been doing that both within and beyond the academy. I think the other thing to say is that all of these kinds of projects, these kind of making sociology public, engaging engaging publics can really benefit from actually working with people who know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, like, um, and I'm saying this from the point of view of having worked with museum professionals, having worked with um, my podcast producer, Emma Holton at Art of Podcast, who I'll thank shortly, um, through working with some very, very talented animators mm. and illustrators over the course of the last few years, and of course with George. Um, because actually those are the collaborations where you see the potential mm-hmm. for sociology to move outwards. It's not just about what we can do. I think we tend to think of ourselves as like a jack of all trades and actually we're, we're not really, are we? No, I am very comfortable, <laughs> I'm very comfortable in talking about the things that I cannot do and there is quite a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, me too. I cannot draw, which is why one of the reasons why, why, why George, um, George came on board. But um, but yeah, so so I think that the potential for public sociology lies in thinking about the ways in which we might work with other people who have different skill sets to bring our ideas to life. And I've seen some fantastic examples of that, mm. um, you know, recently. And I think there's real potential there for us to, to think about it. You know, we've got okay. to stop thinking of ourselves as the lone scholar. I oh, think, God, really. definitely. Um, and, and thinking more definitely. about, you know, collaboration. Who, who we can collaborate with. Mm. So, yeah. Were there any topics that we really wanted to cover on the podcast but couldn't for some reason? Um, so it's really interesting because there are a few things that I haven't yet managed to cover 
but that um, actually in the last few weeks it looks like I am actually going to be able to cover. So one of the original um, topics at the heart of the um, funding proposal was to look at the cases of British Overseas Territory citizens. Mm. And um, for a variety of reasons, um, that, that, that didn't happen in the original round of recordings and editing. But in the last um, couple of weeks, I've actually been contacted by the British Overseas Territory Citizens Campaign Group and also by the British Indian Ocean Territory Citizens Campaign Group. Um, And it looks like I'm actually going to be able to do that work. So working with some activists to um, to produce episodes that focus on the particular issues um, there. I'm also hoping to do an episode on citizenship deprivation. Um, which I think is a really important and very timely topic at the moment. Mm. But there's so many topics. And, you know, for me, um, this has been a real, um, it's been a real, a really rich learning experience, actually, um, of kind of thinking through and looking at some of the quite urgent contemporary issues and looking at the kind of backstories to them and thinking about what they can tell us sociologically about the construction of Britishness um and the kind of exclusions that 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 has written in so Mm -hmm. and how and also how it's linked to kind of global political economy so Mm -hmm. later on in the series in an episode that that you you haven't yet um that Chantal hasn't yet heard and I don't think George has even heard this interview (laughs) yet we talk about the relationship between um the uh 9-11 Mm-hmm. Um, between 9-11 and what happens to citizenship at that point in time when I talk with Cameron Khan. Um, I'll big up Cameron. Yeah, so, you know, I think that, you know, we've, we've told a story which could basically be um, explained as it was all the Conservative government's fault. Mm. But actually, in the early 2000s, we also see a, the Blairite t- uh, Labour government actually continuing... And laying the foundations for some of the things that we've seen more recently, actually. So so there is, you know, some, some bigger kind of global issues that come to play. So the rise of Islamophobia and how that then also mm-hmm. shapes um, citizenship discussions and migration discussions in particular ways in Britain. I think that that's all of the questions so far, unless anyone's got a burning one. And I'm really sorry if I haven't done justice to those questions. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I mean, can I ask something maybe? I mean, yeah. it's not really a question rather than bringing another point into discussion. I just remembered about the, you know, one of the, um, the news we were looking at. It, most of them are quite... Um, sad (laughs) let's say but there was this kind of funny story about the brazilian academic who who did uh, who took the citizenship test the british citizenship test and he was one of the very first people to pass the test in welsh and not in english and the reason he said he did that was exactly to point at this um uh, fact of Englishness within the UK, uh, within within the UK borders of the nation state, even uh, in relation to you know the different countries that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I and the I, languages <laughs> also. Sorry, yeah, the, la- the, the, the so this aspect of language also. Yeah, somehow. I think that's a really important point, and it really disrupts. I, I mean, there's that's the episode with Amory Fortier, which will go out in the new year talks about linguistic imperialism and how that's at the heart of the citizenship test and so the fact that you you know that this basically this test existed where you could take the test in welsh but nobody had ever taken it and this brazilian academic um like seeks it out and he learns welsh well enough to actually pass the citizenship test in welsh and um i think that that was that was one of our kind of we really, we really liked yeah. that story, didn't we? <laughs> um, you know, from the point of view of, of reminding people, as George has just said, that sometimes when we're talking about Britishness, actually we're talking about Englishness. Mm. And the kind of like the Anglicisation of citizenship, I think, is is really um, a, a really important point there. So, so yeah. I mean, was there anything, you know, Chantal, you've listened to a few of the episodes. Was mm. there anything that you were like, oh, you know, we should... Uh, um, you know, maybe I hope they're going to do that. Or I think I think you got it covered, Mikola. I'm not just saying that because I haven't got any, I haven't got any question, I haven't got any questions. I think that it's a really powerful piece of knowledge production of scholarship that's really important. I think it really pushes back against yeah reactionary accounts both within the media and that's of some left wing media as well. 
um, and also academic scholarship that isn't centering like myth busting, but also locating this within wider histories and politics of Britain, empire and coloniality. Like, I just think it's such a great piece of work and I'm, yeah, really proud of you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm slightly speechless now. Why? It's true. <laughs> There's been loads of people on this call that are it's brilliant. It really, really is. So I suppose that just leaves me to say that you can find out more about the podcast, which we're going to be releasing fortnightly for as long as I've got episodes, on all your major podcasting platforms. Your um, preferred podcast platform. <laughs> your preferred. <laughs> yeah. um, and you, I mean, that the, we have a website. It's um, who do you think who do we think we are dot org. Um, so you can find all of the information there. You can find all the transcripts for the mm-hmm. episodes there as well. You can follow us on social media. We're everywhere now. Um, our, our our handle is abt citizenship mm-hmm. on Instagram and Twitter. Um, but I just want to say some big thank yous. Actually, I want to thank my production company, Art of Podcasts, and in particular Emma Halton, who tells me that before. Um, she has been with me since I first started um, podcasting for Brexit Brits Abroad. Um, and with this podcast, it has been a slow process. And she really has chivied me along when I was doubting myself, because this is a major departure for me in terms of the, you know, the narrative format. Also to George, without whom, again, I don't think any of this would have been possible. Okay, I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, to my fantastic contributors. Uh, um, you'll have got some spoilers about who some of them are from this um, conversation Um, but they were extremely generous with their time and I was just so lucky to be able to speak to some people whose work I really admired um, and and to kind of have really really engaging conversations with them about what they were doing um, and to any future contributors as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to thank Chantal, obviously, for, for hosting this today. But also, I want to thank the rest of Surviving Society because Aww. Georgia Foriado, um, your producer, your executive producer, yeah. and Tiso, have also um, you know, provided advice at points um, along this journey about what to do. I'm going to thank um, Bev Skeggs and Michael Lambert at the Centre for Alternatives to Social and Economic Inequality, and to Soho Radio Studios, which is where we are recording. It's nice today. in here. It's, it's really nice. nice in it's here. nice. Um, and I want to thank those of you who are already listening to the podcast um, and recommending it to your um, networks. I just hope it travels. Um, so, so get it on yeah. your reading list. As thank well. you very much. And I will hand back over to to the studio in Lancaster. 